This video is about public goods and it goes over the roommate example from Halvarian's chapter. Um, and of course, public goods are goods that are non-rival and non-excludable, that's just the technical definition. But there's some other classes of issues in economics that have to do with public goods. Sometimes they're related, um, and one of those is the free rider problem. So the chapter has this example where roommates are buying a TV, and of course you can have a situation where one roommate is a free rider, where um, they both kind of want a TV, one of the roommates buys it and the other doesn't pay anything but gets to enjoy the TV, in which case that roommate's a free rider. And this is a game theory matrix that sort of represents that. Um, so in this situation, um, we have Ender and Bean who are roommates, and if they both buy the TV, um, then they both get negative 50 utils because they both spent a lot of money, and of course that's no good anyway because we're duplicating the TV. If one person buys them, so in this square we have Bean buying the TV, and Ender is the free rider, doesn't have to pay for the TV, but gets to enjoy it. So Ender gets 100 utils. Bean gets negative 50, just like he did up here, because he paid the full price for the TV. Um, and in this situation, it's the reverse, where um, Bean is the free rider and Ender bought the TV. And of course, if there's no TV, there's no utility. So um, you can look at this game theory matrix and find out the Nash equilibrium, of course, is for neither person to buy a TV. But that's not Pareto optimal because we could have a situation where one person bought the TV, for example here, Bean buys the TV, and since Bean is worse off here than Bean would be if neither of them bought the TV, we could just uh, rectify that by having Ender pay Bean some money to get, um, for example, and uh, uh, perhaps Ender could pay Bean $50, in which case Ender gets 50 utils, Bean gets uh, gets uh, zero utils, that would be one solution, or we could ha sort of split the surplus where Ender pays Bean $75, so Ender gets $25 of utility, Bean gets $25 of utility. And when you're trying to figure out uh, what's the optimal solution in some sort of uh, free rider situation where you're trying to rectify the problem by having one party pay another, it can be helpful sometimes to come up with a total so social welfare in the, in the function. So here, um, if we just replicate this entire payoff matrix, just indicating the social welfare in the, in the roommate situation. So here we have negative 50 plus negative 50, negative 100. Um, in this situation, and of course this is the free rider situation, and actually let me, let me write that out. Okay, so we have the two free riding situations. In both of these cases, the total social welfare is 50. We have 100 minus 50 is 50, and 0. So in this case, it doesn't really matter which of the two buys the TV. But um, we, want, we, we recognize that the social welfare is highest in these two boxes, so we'd like to go to these two boxes and um, at least give somebody positive utility. I mean, the most fair way to do that is probably to split the 50 utils evenly, in which case this would be a situation where if we're in this box and Bean's buying the TV, Ender is paying Bean $75 for that, so they both end up with $25. Now, we could have a situation where um, one roommate, for example, gets a discount on the TV and they have different utilities for watching TV, so we might not necessarily have symmetric payoffs. So in that case, it's even more useful to do this social welfare thing to figure out which box has the highest social welfare to figure out um, how to solve this free rider problem. So here we have... So here we have a situation where the maximum possible social welfare is 48. Given the asymmetries, that's better than this free rider situation. So in this case, it's best if Harriet buys the TV, perhaps with her employee discount, and Emma pays um, Harriet to divide up this, this social welfare. So here I'm going over this equation from Halvarian's chapter on public goods, and I'm going to talk about this as if the public good they're buying is a TV for the two roommates. And of course this problem only has two people involved, so there's only two players in the problem. And I'm going to let our public good be a TV, but of course this setup works for lots of other public goods um, in a situation where there's only two people deciding. 
Um, the choice variables here are the quality of the public good. In our roommate situation, this is the quality of the TV they buy, where we know that the cost of the TV depends on the quality. The higher quality, the higher cost we have. And then our other two choice variables are how much we have left, um, or how much each roommate gets to spend on things other than the TV. Um, when we have roommates, one gets to spend X dollars on everything else, basically composite good, and roommate made two also gets to spend a certain amount on everything else. So what are we maximizing here? We're actually only maximizing one thing, and that is the utility of person one, which is a little bit weird and a little bit unfair. So we're going to relax that assumption and see if we can adjust this equation to try to make this situation more fair in a minute. But for now, let's just interpret this equation as it is. So utility of person one depends on how much they get to spend on other things besides the TV, and it also depends on the quality of the TV. And then we've got two lambdas here, and that indicates that these are probably constraints. These are probably Lagrange multipliers where we're inserting some kind of constraint into our optimization problem. And it can even sometimes help when we're thinking about interpreting a constraint to try to rewrite this as an inequality. So first let's read it um, in the way I hope you read these, and then let's reconstruct it as an inequality. So we've got the wealth of person one, how much money they make per year, plus the wealth of person two. And now I'm thinking, okay, um, usually these uh, constraints cluster positive side on one side of the constraint, negative things on the other side of the constraint. So these two are probably going to be clustered together on one side of the inequality, um, or the equality actually, if you're gonna stick it inside this maximization problem. And so this is the total wealth of the people in the, in the roommate situation. Who The total wealth of the people who live in the house is that. Um, so I'm just going to think about that. Um, wealth of the people in the house. And then I'll read the other three things which are probably clustered on the other side of the inequality or the equality. This is how much um, roommate one has to spend on other stuff plus how much roommate two has to spend on other stuff um, plus um, and I'm saying plus because I'm imagining moving these to the other side of a constraint, uh, plus the cost of the TV. So when I try to think about when I cluster these together, is there an interpretation of that? And that basically sounds like how much money is spent. So it, this actually sounds pretty much like a budget constraint, and it is a budget constraint. We've got how much money you have is going, going to equal how much money you spend. But let's actually rewrite that as an inequality just to make it really clear. Okay, so I've set up this inequality, and if you don't know which way the inequality goes, you can always set it up as an equality, um, and that usually works generally, but um, it's a budget constraint, so we know there probably will be some sort of inequality, uh, uh, and we can figure that out based on how do budget constraints work. So we've got the amount of money in the apartment equals the total amount spent, or the, the income in the apartment, the wealth of people in the apartment, equals how much is spent total on roommate one stuff, roommate two stuff, and the television. Um, so yeah, simple budget constraint. Uh, so let's label that. Alright, so we have Another constraint, we've got a second lambda, and this indicates that we're sticking something else, some other um, inequality, some other constraint into our problem. And that constraint is, well, the interpretation of U bar 2 is the utility of person 2 without a public good. So how happy is roommate 2 without any TV? Assuming we don't get any TV, it's exogenous in this model, so we're just sort of, we already know how happy they are. And this is utility of roommate two, um, given how much stuff they get to consume that's not the TV, how much they buy otherwise, and the quality of the TV. And of course, this has a similar setup as this. These are both the utility, the happiness of each roommate when they buy a TV of quality G. So if we're thinking about this as an inequality, um, we are forcing you, roommate two's utility to be equal to what it was before we got the TV. So let's write up that inequality and then we'll talk about how unfair it is. 
Well, so we're basically forcing roommate two's utility to equal um, their utility. Roommate two's utility when we buy the TV is going to be equal to their utility without the TV. And of course, we had when we came down here to our budget constraint, we knew that what we spend has to be less than or equal to what we make. Um, because we can't spend more than we actually have, so that's an inequality. And if we think of this one as an inequality, um, we know that roommate two is not going to go along with this if buying the TV makes them worse off. So we know that um, whatever utility they get from buying the TV needs to be greater than or equal to, to their utility from not buying the TV. Um, and so that might start to sound familiar, and as a matter of fact, this is a Pareto optimality constraint. So we're forcing a situation where roommate two is no worse off than they were before we bought the TV. Um, yet, we're probably improving roommate one's utility by buying the TV. So doing this is a Pareto improvement over not having the TV, but of course, uh, forcing this constraint in like this means that roommate two's utility is going to be exactly equal to what it was before. So all of the benefit that goes from buying the TV is accruing to roommate one. And that's not as fair as we would like it to be. So um, we might think about how can we set up a slightly different equation that's a little bit more fair. Let's say we wanted to split the surplus gain from buying the TV equally between the roommates, or let's say we just wanted a different setup. What might that look like? Well, um, obviously this constraint is going to go away, so let's get rid of that. Now of course we have to keep our budget constraint, we can never get rid of our budget constraint because this is just a law of the universe. So let's say now, instead of forcing player two's utility to be equal to player two's old utility before we bought the TV, we wanted to force player two's utility to be equal to player one's utility. Um, in which case, we could do that by adding a constraint that simply sets those two people's utilities equal. So um, let's actually write out that equality up here so we can look at it before we put it into the equation. This is just me stating that I want to force whatever outcome to set the utility of player one equal to the utility of player two. And of course, I can stick this in just like I stick in any other constraint. So let's do that. So that's just me taking this constraint, pulling that to the other side, and sticking it into the maximization problem using a Lagrange multiplier. And this is forcing the player's utility to be equal. But of course there's problems with this too. It's possible that one of these people is really rich, another one of them is really poor. So by forcing them to be equal, um, it's possible that one or the other of these two people might be worse off buying the TV than if we didn't buy the TV. There's nothing stopping that given the current setup of this equation, but we have forced um, equal utility here. Um, now let's say, let's say we wanted to maximize total social welfare. How would we do that? Well, um, maximizing total social welfare, we need to add up everybody's, let's, and let's use a utilitarian social welfare function where we just add up everybody's utility, in which case, Right now we're only maximizing player one's utility. Let's maximize player one plus player two's utility and I'm gonna get rid of this constraint since this could lead to some funky outcomes. Um, so let's look at that. So here we are maximizing social welfare, utility of person one plus utility of person two subject to a budget constraint. Um, so this is going to be welfare maximizing, but it might possibly make one of these two people worse off um, than if we weren't maximizing social welfare. So basically, it's, you, we can't construct a perfect situation where the maximization problem will lead to a definite outcome that we, that's perfect in all scenarios. But we're really just playing around with what does this equation mean? What do the different types of 
constraints look like. We can have a Pareto optimality constraint, we can have a budget constraint, and what do the objective functions, and of course our objective function here is social welfare, where our objective is to maximize social welfare. And that's utilitarian because we're just adding people's utilities together. And I think that just about covers it for this particular equation in Hal Varian's chapter.